Welcome, everybody, to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 76. We are bringing you guys an interview, a very important interview with the author of American Shield. He is Akalino Ganell. He defended our capital and our democracy with his colleagues on January 6th. And he's going to tell you his very beautiful, profound journey as an American immigrant who served in multiple wars in the military and then served his country on that dark and violent day and the repercussions that it's had. But more than anything, gentlemen, I'm so grateful that he speaks his truth. Aren't we lucky that we had that beautiful interview with him? He's an amazing dude. Um, you know, somebody it, it, who should be, who should not be as remarkable as he is, right? Yeah. And he says it himself, which which makes it, you know, makes him, as you said, even more sort of um, heroic. And yeah. he really, he really is. He battled for fucking hours, and then people have been tormenting him. Um for doing his duty. Yeah, and we're gonna be talking about the network that is tormenting heroes like that. And it is worth noting, he does not want to be called a hero. He looks at it as somebody who was doing his job after he'd taken an oath to do so. But what he really is, is an incredibly moral, moral human being. And what a blessing to get to know him. Hi, Fi. I just, I, I am reminded of the words of Shakespeare that you know, to paraphrase, some are born to greatness, some achieve greatness, and and some have greatness thrust upon them. Yeah. And this well. this man, this decent, honorable man, had greatness thrust upon him, and now he's paying a price for it. And rose to the occasion. Um, so yeah, so we want to get you guys to that interview as those who watched us. Before, we we're an investigative show about disinformation, and it came in quite handy with our interview with Sergeant Gunnell. So what do you say that we uh, jump into Front Loaded, which actually starts off with something very pertinent to this conversation? Front Loaded. All right. You guys know what I want to talk about. I want to talk about Episode 7, the grand finale of Lawyers, Guns, and Money. Anybody can access that by subscribing to this incredible show uh, produced, no, no by, produced, by, <laughs> produced by John Cryer and <laughs> produced by Jack A. Bryan, uh, interviewing John Mattis, who uh, bravely stood up to the American government and a bunch of uh, cartel folks in order to really um, expose the network behind uh, the Iran-Contra scandals, plural. Um, episode six is available right now. That also is banging. But number seven, and the reason I'm directing everyone's attention to it, and I encourage you to take out a subscription so you can listen now. If not, you have to wait until Sunday. Episode seven explains the network connections behind the scandal they expose on the show and the insurrection, the January 6th insurrection, the same players, the same MO, networks of military people working in the shadows, networks of militia groups working in the shadows, both uh, overtly and covertly, uh, dark money groups, dark money packs funding this stuff. And you will maybe not be shocked to find out that some of the people we focus on who are actively trying to overthrow our democracy are also present in episode seven. And it's very important to note that at one point, this particular network that Jack and John exposed, they were going after the communist threat. Well, at some point, they turned inward and started going after America and Americans and Democrats and democracy. And the connective tissue is very well mapped out in episode seven. And the last thing I want to say is that Sergeant Gunnell and his colleagues at the Capitol that day waited hours before they got any help. By then they were beaten violently, bloodied, uh, everything that you can imagine, unpatriotic acts with 
uh, with uh, flags from people who are supposed to back the blue. And one of the people who delayed getting help to officers like Sergeant Gunnell happens to be Charles Flynn, a newly minted four-star general. And the network that episode seven exposes is vital to you understanding the attacks that are ongoing today. So thank you for my first TED talk. Uh, yeah, I don't want to give it away uh, or anything, but, you know, I, I think we met, we've been mentioning for a lot of weeks now that there's going to be a significant convergence um, of the characters that we talk about all the time. Um, and this story from decades ago, um, you know, that they're mirroring again, but using modern psychological weapons to do it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, same people doing the same thing in a slightly different way. I'm just, I was blown away at the just fantastic way they connected everything. Matter of factly, you know, not inflammatory, just connected the dots so everybody has the opportunity to understand the network that we are battling and why it must be dismantled with prosecutions at the highest level. And I also think this type of exposure is why we are seeing a ramping up and a ratcheting up of all of the truly grotesque uh, propaganda narratives, because I, I believe that their time is coming and that justice is going to be served. I just hope it's going to be served in time to preserve our democracy. Yeah, I mean, they're going for it, man. Fucking, man, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I mean, good. I'm Pizza glad. Gate, QAnon, you know, all of it. All of it. All of it. Coming back hard, man. And, and it, it is, uh, uh, you know, there's a reason for it because they're trying to, um, they're trying to break us down. Yeah, and high five before you jump in, I uh, want to just make another point. The militia groups uh, were something that was part of the fascist playbook from the very first uh, you know, birth of fascism 100 years ago. It's what Mussolini relied on, these networks of militia groups. So many of these tactics aren't new, but the thing I really want to point out is post-World War II, most of the coups that occurred globally were military coups with a patriarchal frontman and nefarious generals uh, in the shadows uh, using God and patriotism and the othering of immigrants to uh, pave the way for their coups. And so I want Americans to be very keenly aware that we are not immune to this type of activity and lawyers, guns and money dot uh, supercast dot com is where you can listen to EP7 right now. I have two words about lawyers, guns and money, and they are Bill fucking Barr. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The yeah, whenever you see him was, LARPing on, on CNN, like, uh, oh my God. those are the bad people. Uh, uh, <laughs> He's a well, very here, sophisticated uh, fucking uh, operator. Uh, he, he is uh, very sophisticated, but here's one thing I want to say is... Thank you, Hi. You know, Bill, Bill Barr's ties to the radical extremist Catholic group Opus Dei uh, simply mirror the resurgence in QAnon and Pizzagate because, as you know, we discuss with Sergeant Gunnell, uh, these people, you know, have have had their identities overwritten by this cult. It is a theocratic, fascist, radical extremist cult, the same as Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's just Christian flavor now. The the uh, I actually just tweeted about this. Um, ISIS is now using QAnon tactics for their own propaganda they're they're labeling westerners pedophiles uh they're they're talking about trans people they're doing it's 
basically the same. They, they both sort of veered to the same point. And there's a reason for that. It's because Mike Flynn studied ISIS for decades while he was there fighting them. So we're dealing with American ISIS. Thank Full you. Stop. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate that at one point, this network exposed on lawyers, guns, and money for going after communists. They thought the, you know, communist scare, the red scare was bad. Well, guess who they're going after now? You. You. Mm -hmm. They're coming after us. And that's what's happening with this network today. Anti-communism what has for a long time meant white supremacy. It's just that simple. You have groups like the John Birch Society, right? Anti-communist. That's what they what they did. John Singlob had lots and lots of groups who show who shows up in, in lawyers, guns, and money, which was anti-communist, but it was racist, anti-Semitic at yeah. its core. It was white Christian nationalism. And so when you hear that that phrase we're yeah. anti-communist yeah uh, there's a usually there's a, a swastika lurking behind well if we're going to go there jim then let's talk about how uh when we're looking back to iran contra and we're realizing much of this was funded by cartel money let's talk about who the cartel is today and some of it probably decades ago but now it's very important to know that these networks are funded uh by lobbyists uh, or or actually they're the pass through are the lobbyists funded by fossil fuel organizations and oligarchs tied to putin's russia really important to note that um these people who call themselves patriots are actually trying to overthrow our country and in a few minutes you're going to meet a true patriot so that's just something i wanted to add cool Ready, let's go. Let's go on to Front Loaded 2. So it is my honor to point people to our friend, President Jackie Singh, who did a keynote address, uh, the threat actors we forget to model, profiling socially motivated cyber criminals. This is something that was just released a few days ago. You can go to hackingbutlegal.com to find uh, the keynote. Um, Jackie Singh summarized six months of work dismantling one of the most vicious hate cults who was targeting a science fiction writer uh, for no reason other than he just got in the crosshairs through one random tweet. But she shows the, uh, the way that he was targeted in an attempt to completely annihilate his life, much as we talked about with Alex Alvarova and Zerzetsung, the East German Stasi techniques. But Jackie, because she has a background in InfoSec, and most of you guys know she was uh, the Biden 2020 campaign's lead threat analyst in cybersecurity, the second hire in that particular um, campaign. She went after him. She exposed him. She figured out who they were. She also managed to change policy because now the FBI has had to look at swatting and the abuse of those who phone in phony threats and show up at people's got the police show up at people's houses thinking there's a real threat. And uh, they're now addressing how to deal with that because of one woman, Jackie Singh's desire to go in and right a wrong and stop this from happening. And we are so damn proud of her. Um, so I have been privileged uh, to be behind the scenes uh, with Jackie while she's been doing this and helping, uh, you know, a little bit with <laughs> Jackie. That, that is, that place that she went to is the most horrifying, um, despicable abuse website that I've ever seen. And I've seen them all. Um, and, and, you know, half of it is targeting one guy and, uh, for no reason at all. It's pure hate. It's, 
it's just a way for people who need an obsession to uh, and who are sadists and sociopaths and psychopaths to gather together to try and destroy a single person and and these are some of the most hateful people and most dangerous people I've ever seen and Jackie fucking rolled in there like a hurricane wrecked it unbelievable so you know it is it is one of the one of the greatest uh you know honors of my life to be able to to watch that unfold and, and yes she has my vote yes I will follow her and do any better the other thing I want to point out is the members of this hate cult did not like it when she exposed their true identities. They did not like the sunlight on their uh, pernicious, hateful behavior. And I think that's worth noting um, that they're able to harm people uh, in the sadistic way Jim was just describing but they they do not like it when it's pointed out who actually is behind it. So no, no, they act they they act like little fucking kids. They're like you and not me with him. I mean, they're fucking children. The LARPing as adults with kids of their own. It's it's you know, I I, I just I, again I I can't believe what I could not believe what I saw. Just yeah. Fucking, rolled into a nest of vipers and there's still some little vipers running around trying to trying to nip at her heels and shit <laughs> she's like Fuck off. she Fuck off. because she was tormented when she announced working for the biden campaign as was i when i announced working for congressional and i never announced the other campaigns i worked for because i wanted to defer the pain for a while um she has experience at being the target and of this stuff so she doesn't take it lightly and she went all in and I, uh, I honor her for her integrity and her brilliance and just her incredible tenacity. High I five. Mean, at some point we'll have to uh, showcase George Santos. <laughs> <laughs> she rolled into a space with George Santos in it and owned it so hard that, that George Santos was like, why aren't you in the Biden administration? What's wrong with the Biden administration? So, I mean, it was, it was incredible. And yeah. she got him to, you know, confess to a bunch of stuff and walked out of there a fucking rock star, you yeah. know, to George Santos's audience, which was incredible. I kept telling her the whole time. Ask, ask him about the Vexelberg funding. And she's like, I'll get to that next. Ask yeah. him about the oligarch money that's funding him. Um, hi, hi. I, I think the, the thing that's most disturbing about Jackie's presentation is um, this this entry right here. And it's, it's kind of hard to read. But, uh, you know, swatting is basically sending the police to someone's house to kill them. Yeah. And right here, you can purchase that service for $50. And she exposed who offers that service, and they did not like the exposure. And the threatening message that was left was like, well, it's not me, and you're just using my name, and it could be anybody. I do have this type of weapon. I do have this type of weapon. It was uh, super awful. And Jackie, yeah, I'm not it. this guy. I'm somebody worse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> like, okay, wow. <laughs> yeah, that that does remind me. I have to call the Alachua County Sheriff's Office in Florida and ask them oh, yeah. if they discovered the member of their staff who was using yeah. police resources to track their victim. Um, yeah. Allegedly, uh, th this person Allegedly. In indicated that that's who they were. So, yeah, let, well, what's been done about that? All right. Well, Jackie is a hero. And um, because I write a lot about monsters, um, the people who 
the U.S. criminals who are out accelerating global fascism. I thought around the holiday, it would be good to also give thanks to American heroes who fuel the work that I do and millions of others. Uh, I want to just have you go to uh, Profiles in Courage, and I just want to give a few shout outs to people who are brave and wonderful, as Jackie, as Sergeant Gunnell. Ruth ben first and foremost for me, her lucid sessions are historic. She saw all this coming, warned everybody in 2015, uh, and is just a, a, an incredibly humble, brilliant icon, uh, helping fuel those of us who fight fascism. David Pepper, a dad, an author, democratic hero, someone who comes on our show a lot. He offers the tools we need to actually beat uh, the extremists um, by just doing the labor of democracy, which is hard but important. Joyce Vance, brilliant legal analyst, also writes about chickens that help kind of give us a breather when we see her chickens. Heather Cox Richardson, when Ruth referred to her as a stand for Biden, I thought that was so perfect. Heather Cox Richardson tells us the things that Biden is actually doing that are helpful and she also gives us some great history lessons as she did when she wrote a memoir about Lady Bird Johnson. And then Jason Stanley, who I miss on Twitter, he wrote How Fascism Works. He's been on our show. He's incredibly important. Um, I do miss him, but you can still find him writing and you know interviewed. And we're going to bring him back as soon as we can because he wrote the brilliant uh, report on um, fascism's legal uh, phase, which is what we are in right now, as this team damn well knows. Uh, Timothy Snyder. I don't know if I could do this without Timothy Snyder and his Making of Modern Ukraine series. I'm reading another one of his books right now. He's written more than On Tyranny. Bloodlands is very important. Um, and then just a couple homies I want to give a shout out to. Jeff Charlotte, our friend, Martin Scheel, our good friend, Jackie Singh, we've already covered that, and my brilliant podcast partners, Jim and Hi-Fi. You guys keep me going on my worst days. So that's front-loaded. What does it matter, High Fidelity? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why High Fidelity? First story this week, we're going to talk about what about Africa? What do I mean by that? Well, we all just went through a holiday. I'm sure there was some political discussion probably around Israel and Palestine and Gaza and hostages and everything. Uh, if your family was really attuned to geopolitics, maybe you even talked about Russia and Ukraine. Um, but these things cause a lot of consternation. And one thing I found uh, when interrupting people's cognitive patterns when they're spewing uh, propaganda about these things that they really know very little about is, hey, what about Africa? And the reason I bring up what about Africa is because just recently in Sierra Leone, a group of armed men attacked the military barracks and detention centers. Uh, these were armed separatists uh, in Sierra Leone who were attempting to capture weapons um, and form a militia that is attacking the recognized government of Sierra Leone. And that may sound familiar to you in Africa, because as we all know, that uh, Russia's Wagner was arming uh, a, a militia in Sudan, uh, where currently Russia is pulling out a ton of gold to pay for their war in Ukraine. And if you, you know, like me, have paid attention to Africa, you know that Mali is also allowing Russia to pull gold out of their country. The colonization of Africa, uh, the humanitarian events that are happening in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, uh, in Ethiopia, in the Eritrea region, Africa is a mess right now. And the best way to help Africa is simply one thing, arm Ukraine to fight Russia. Yeah. So the military contractors in Africa that are Russian, get the hell out of that country. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, 
just today, the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, said Ukraine will join NATO after the war, making it that much more imperative that the West must arm Ukraine, not just for Ukraine, but also for the havoc and chaos that Russia is causing in Syria, Sudan, Mali, Burkina Faso, Somalia. I mean, the list goes on and on. Yeah. All these things are connected. So if you find yourself in a rough little conversation spot over the holidays with family, just say, hey, what about Africa? That's why it matters. Thank you, Hi-Fi. That was brilliant. And two things I want to say real quick, Jim, um, is that uh, Russia is paying for its war by money laundering gold through the UAE. So that's one thing I wanted to um, bring up. And the other thing is that Wagner moved its um, influence operation, its disinformation operation to Africa, to Nigeria, specifically from St. Petersburg. And so as we know from Ukraine's attack in 2014, the disinformation onslaught precedes the kinetic coups. So I'd also like to mention um, one Eric fucking Prince, uh, who uh, is frankly behind a lot of those yeah. uh, coups. Yeah. Because Eric Prince has been working with Wagner and its related entities um, for fucking yeah. decades. Um, it, it is also not a coincidence that Eric Prince funded another Libyan, um, I mean, another African um, civil war in Libya, which is why he is under indictment for it. Yeah. Why, he, why he's in, on trial for it. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, he just started a podcast. He just went on a QAnon show. Listen to this real quick. Shocking. Eric went on a QAnon show to sell a ghost phone uh -huh. that has a switch on it that will erase all of your shit in case you get caught yeah. doing crimes. Yeah. What 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 could go wrong? Well, With Eric Prince. Selling a, a phone that makes all of the evidence that we saw on January 6th go away. Yeah. Well, let's do a little rewind on that. Whose evidence was wiped, according to the Mueller report, the communications between Steve Bannon and Eric Prince around the time of the Seychelles back channel meeting. So he does know something about wiping evidence. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is, of course, he has a podcast now because the disinformation pollution has to be ramped up. He's currently under indictment. So he's got to start, you know, uh, spinning the lies that, uh, you know, have been so effective um, till now. So, yeah, makes sense to me. And actually, Jim, thank you for bringing up Eastern Libya, because Eastern Libya actually plays a larger part in uh, what's going on in Africa than most people know about, because there were rebels trained under uh, Wagner PMC and Eric Prince uh, that went south from Libya and actually entered Chad and in 2021 killed the president yeah. of that country. And now Chad is undergoing uh, domestic strife. So... Yeah. If you don't see the yeah. network in action, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. you know? Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's why it matters. That's why it matters. Speaking of coups, that brings us to our next story this week, which finally corporate media is paying attention to. We will coup whoever we want. Yeah. The unbearable hubris of Musk and the billionaire tech bros. Um, yeah, Musk, Teal, that's right. Oh, hi, thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. Of course, Zuckerberg, Sam Bankman Freed, uh, these, these men are shysters. They are con men. Uh, they are, they are liars bolstered by a mythos that they are undeserving of and what they have done instead of building this grand new society is they've attempted to destroy liberal democracy globally. Um, 
in their favor. They want to take over. If you've read The Dark Enlightenment, or you understand Bannon's fascination with the fourth turning by uh, Julia Nivola, you would know that these men are not here to help you. These men are here to destroy, lay waste to what exists, and hopefully build something on the ashes of our civilization. They are also they are also criminals. So yes, Indeed. yes. Well, they're, they're they're and they're they're using psychological warfare to psyop people into thinking that the fucking apocalypse is here. Pick doesn't matter what you believe. There's some version of it that is going to have an apocalypse, right? Christianity has it. Judaism has it. Islam has it. Catholicism. Everybody has a myth that says, you know, really what we need is a giant fucking fire in the world where everything explodes so that our Messiah can come. Right. So they weaponize that. They weaponize anything. Bannon has his special occult guy, uh, Ju Julius Evola, who is very important, and sometime we should talk about him. Um, but stop fucking falling for this stuff. It's not that the end of the world may come, but only because we stumble fuck our way into it because we're too distracted <laughs> by all this dumb crap. And to put a point on that, I just want to say it would be really nice if these criminals accelerating global fascism had to do more than pay fines when they are found out uh, for, you know, betraying our democracy. You know, five billion dollars payout from Facebook, you know, yeah, it probably hurts, you know, Fox paying out almost a billion. Yeah, it probably didn't feel great. Uh, come on, we can do better than that. There's, there's got to be a price to pay uh, for the high-level criminals that are selling out our, our well-being. You know, not not just our democracy and our way of life, but just our, our mental well-being among family. It's got to be a price for that. Aye, there should aye. be. Aye, aye. All right, what's next? Where's my pitchfork? Right. Final story this week: in for a penny, in for a pound. And this story has to do with new revelations brought to light by Byline Times, in which the British Army is training soldiers from countries that have had recent coups. And in this story, they discuss training soldiers uh, from Mali, from Niger, from Egypt, Thailand, Chad. Um, yeah, they're making money off of these countries that have been overthrown by these strongmen who are backed by Russian militias. Um, I, I don't get the appropriateness of this behavior for a country that claims to be, you know, about democracy. Um, again, one has to wonder, what the fuck are our militaries thinking? And that's why it matters. I, I let me let me uh, add add one thing to that. Another thing, get the button ready. Um, is the National Health Service of Britain just gave a huge multi hundred million dollar contract to who? Oh hi, thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. Exactly. To Palantir, the private intelligence, data munching, psyop enabling monstrosity Palantir that that Peter Thiel got his first contract from the U.S. government from who? Mike fucking Flynn. Yeah, the network guys, network. Um Hi-fi on that story. I want to say that all media that still uses the term, you know, so-and-so backed separatists, that's propaganda language. It's always freaking Russia sticking their, you know, nose and other people's shit to steal it. And it's not blank backed separatists at all. It's literally like, you know, uh, little green men who go and steal other people's shit. Um, I do want to point out, Paul Nyland, who's a good friend of the show, who lives in Kiev and runs the uh, Ukraine suicide hotline, um, 
he he just wrote an incredible important piece about the weaponization of starvation on the anniversary of Stalin's manufactured famine in Ukraine and how Russia uses uh, starvation as a war tactic. It's not only historically relevant, it's happening today. And he writes about that. So please do go to Byline Supplement and uh, get informed. And if you're not going to get informed, uh, I regret to inform you that we're all going to be trapped in a hellscape. Jim Stewartson's Hellscape. Oh, fuck. All right. We need a revolution. We need a revolution of grown-ups. I, I, I look around and I see children running the world. Angry little children who haven't yet developed the, the qualities that adults have, right? The people, I just want to take a moment and reflect on the people that I work with, the people that have been helping me, that have been, you know, that, that I've been following. They're, uh, they're adults. They have children. They take responsibility for things. They acknowledge when they're wrong and they cheerlead their friends and stand by them. They're, they're humans, fully grown. And there's still a lot of us left. But we're being overrun by children. And I'm old enough <laughs> to uh, be able to say it's time to grow up. We need to recognize what's happening around us. We need to inform the people that don't understand. We need to be the grown-ups in the room. Because the fucking world needs grown-ups again. The, 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 what's been done to us by people like Elon Musk, who has been validating and spreading and intentionally fomenting the worst psychological warfare in the world, artificially pumping up on his platform the worst propagandists in the world, constantly validating them while he suppresses people he doesn't like. He's a child, a child with a quarter of a trillion dollars. A child who was brought up in a racist family who went to South Africa in order to be with their fellow Nazis. That never left him. He is a child still in apartheid South Africa, raging about black people and Jewish people all fucking day. And then he goes, Today, as I'm speaking, LARPing in Israel with Benjamin Netanyahu. Why? To, to cover up his tracks, to try and say, oh, the last two years of radicalizing people on purpose. Forget about that. I went to Israel. I'm, you know. Forget about the fact that Netanyahu was warned about it and did do jack shit, that he's currently ethnic cleansing Gazans. Children. Benjamin Netanyahu got his hand caught in the motherfucking cookie jar. Literally 
a corrupt thief who's been propping up, by the way, Hamas for decades. Motherfucker got his hand caught in a cookie jar, went to Uncle Putin, who ran some psyops and active measures and got that guy back in the prime minister's seat. A child who who's stuck, who's so compromised and and defeated that he would go along with atrocities in his own country, go along with the the script we're being fed that the end times are here and we need a big calamity in the Middle East. Children playing with fucking toys. We need to stop being the goddamn toys. The people I I work with are extraordinary people, but they are also ordinary people. That's what makes them extraordinary. They have families and they give a shit. And they care about the country that they grew up in. That's all. That's it. I don't give a shit what you believe. Be a grown-up. That's all I care. Live by the simplest rules that if you're religious, your religion teaches you. The goddamn golden rule. There's nothing wrong with it. Treat others like you want to be treated. That's it. Grow up. And reject these fucking children who, by dint of their their genetics and their fucking upbringing, and I don't give a shit, are stunted little monsters. Who need to be set on the fucking steps and given a timeout while the grown-ups, you know, have a drink and figure out what to do about it. Thank you for listening to my rant today. I am extremely tired of being run by children. Arrest Mike Flynn. Now we're going to introduce you to an adult. He has been the recipient of many medals of valor. Uh, He is a Dominican immigrant and I'd say one of the greatest Americans uh, we've ever met. He is, of course, Sergeant Aquilino Ganell, the author of American Shield. Aquilino Ganell, we are so thrilled that you are here with us today. We are fans, I suppose you can say that, for your courage and your bravery and your testimony, uh, giving voice to the people who were at the insurrection January 6th, giving voice to your colleagues. And, uh, and of course, now you have this beautiful new book, which tells your very important immigrant experience and speaks of your service to this country. And as this book, uh, you know, is coming out, um, kind of how are you feeling? What's going through your head and your heart? Uh, Thanks for having me, Haiti. Uh, Well, my name, uh, I'm very happy for for, uh, being your show and also to speak about the book, uh, the book. Uh, on its own, it's uh, it's about January 6th, but not just about January 6th. It's uh, about what led me to take up uh, a life of ser- public service uh, from uh, you know my ch- early childhood, uh, arriving here in the United States at uh, age 12, uh, and then uh, the typical immig- immigrant story of overcoming a lot of obstacles and uh, adversities. Um, then subsequently uh, that led me to join the military and as well uh, becoming a police officer with the United States Capitol Police. Right. And you, um, 
I documented your words and the words of your colleagues when you testified uh, in front of the January 6th committee. And your words stand out to me as being so eloquent and so profound, um, talking about this medieval, you know, uh, noise that you heard. And what was it kind of about your personal story and your background that I think made you able to really relate to the American people uh, in such eloquent words, what really happened that day? I mean, if you read in the, as you're gonna read in the book, or if you have read it, um, you have the great amount of uh, people uh, that, that were attacking the Capitol that day, they were nat native born citizens. And here we are, uh, a whole bunch of police officers, uh, a great amount of them uh, foreign, na uh, foreign born, uh, naturalized citizens. And uh, along with, with uh, a lot of our colleagues that were born here, uh, let me give them credit as well. Uh, we defended the Capitol, but the majority of people, thousands of people uh, that were attacking and besieging the, the Capitol, they were naturalized citizens. I mean. Uh, native born citizens and uh, the irony is that of, of this is that a lot of republicans elected officials in, in, including uh, people that align with that ideology they continue to say and prophesize that the country is on the attack the, the country is being invaded by foreigners well to my knowledge and to my recollection the people who were assaulting and invading the capital and and breaking into the capital, those were uh, native born citizens. Uh, so it goes against their own narrative of uh, the, the, the country is being overrun. Right. Uh, Jim, do you want to jump in? Yes. It just for me, I've been I've been tracking this uh, the this ideology, this um, movement to, that attacked the capital and has been you know subverting the country. I was curious. Um, what what warning did you have leading up to January six? What was did you have uh, a sense of of the impending um, throngs of white nationalists who were who were descending? Because there were many of us on the outside who knew exactly what was going to happen and informed the FBI and informed you know were as loud as we could. Um, that there would be violence, and and you know my deep concern is that that information have made it to people on the front lines who are going to actually have to deal with it. So I was curious, what was your experience leading up to January sixth? Well, uh, for that particular event on on January sixth, uh, we did not a lot of things differently. Uh, we all had a protocol to follow. Um, standard procedures and nothing changed to my knowledge in terms of uh, how to prepare, how to uh, prevent anything happen. I mean, we had done this only, what, 250 times throughout the okay. US and nothing to this level had risen. Um, the difference is that a lot of the people who were supposed to be making decisions to reinforce the Capitol Police, uh, external and internal, um, they were uh, fearful of the optics of what ha what it would look like if there were uh, certain things put in place, uh, or uh, hesitated or didn't do uh, what they were supposed to, which is send help when we needed them. Uh, if you look at um, internally, the Capitol Police, I think, in my opinion, we didn't have a lot of choices because. In order for us to prepare, uh, we needed the information for, for some reason. Some well, some of that information was sent through emails, not by phone, by a phone call. Uh, it probably didn't get to the right people. Uh, whether that was intentional or not, that's uh, up for debate. But at least to my level, uh, as a sergeant, uh, as, uh, foot soldiers, if you would say, uh, and my my group, the my subordinates, uh, nothing seems to have triggered the alarm. So uh, we got to do things differently, except for the, the my own colleagues, as I mentioned in the book, 
um, to my subordinate. They were showing me certain things online uh, or through social media. And I, you know, I had the same concerns. I relayed those concerns to my supervisors uh, about me, at least two ranks about me. And uh, at one point, that direction that, uh, that we got was, well, let the containment emergency uh, uh, response team uh, deal with certain things, and we did. Uh, in terms of uh, what we could have done to prepare, a lot of things. Uh, I mean, we have uh, the former president himself telling people, hey, go to the Capitol on January 6th, let's stop the steal. And that didn't trigger uh, any alarm bells then uh, to change the posture of our uh, response that they should have had. Uh, nevertheless, uh, he's the one who incited the mob and uh, after he released the mob on the Capitol, then he didn't do anything to, uh, not even to so do or or tell the people, hey, th this is not what I had in mind. Um, stop, you know, stop breaching the cap, stop attacking the police officers. Yeah. Uh, until it was too late. I mean, by that time he did, I was already injured, me and a right. uh, bunch of other officers. Yeah. Well, well so the, uh, just to follow up briefly, leading up to, but there were many of us um, out here. So I, I wrote a thread, as you can see, de December uh, 30th before telling, you know, it, and it goes on to explain in, in detail mm -hmm. sort of how it was going to go. I warned uh, people on the left not to go because they were going to blame it on Antifa. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, it was very clear exactly what they were planning. There were caravans of people being organized. Um, you know, and, and as I said here, at some point, I'm afraid people are going to die because they were, that was the, um, the, that was the intent. That was the, the intent. intent. It was the express intent of these people. And all you had to do was watch it. And so for me, the, the, the thing that I cannot get my head around is how one, you know, this Twitter guy and some other people figured this out and our entire intelligence, you know, um, infrastructure um, could not warn people like you what was going to happen so that you could protect yourself and the people that work for you. Uh, to me, it's it's just uh, one of the great mysteries and, and I'm sad that the, the, the points were not connected, that the tips that were not put in were not um, you know, taken seriously so that, you know, a lot of trauma and injuries and death could have been prevented. And I agree with that. I mean, this is the miscommunication or not connecting the dots to to uh, imagine what, you know, the worst case scenario. Because, you know, after the election, I think it was November, uh, the following week or immediately after the election when Trump declared uh, himself the winner without no evidence that he was such. Um, he began to plan about this. I remember a um, interview that he did with uh, Chris Wallace a couple of days before the election, I believe, uh, and where Chris Wallace asked him uh, whether he would go out peacefully uh, if he were to lose the election. And he said, we'll see. And I, I took that as immediately, okay, he's he's not going to leave. Uh, yep. He's he going to, just like he, fear, uh, Fury, um, antagonist uh, speech during his inauguration day that culminated with the American carnage uh, mm -hmm. line on it. That's how he exactly ended up with American carnage at the Capitol. Yep. Uh, so he began... Uh, projecting what would happen if he were the president. And after he lost the election, he decided to uh, claim, uh, hold on to power using the Insurrection Act or and declare martial law as well. Uh, there was a lot of planning, uh, a lot of people, uh, both elected officials and non-elected officials that were uh, feeding him information that 
uh, led him uh, to do what, whatever he did. Uh, nevertheless, that does not absolve him of taking responsibility for what he did. Ultimately, he's the one who incited the mob, in my opinion. Ultimately, he's the one who could have sent the carberry by uh, authorizing uh, the National Guard to respond to the Capitol or, or be in place and already, and he right. never did. Uh, now, there's a lot of elected officials that continue to um, say uh, fake, uh, false uh, things like Nancy Pelosi uh, had the authority to call the National Guard. She does it. She's right. the, the only person that has that authority is the commander in chief. And to my knowledge, Nancy Pelosi was not the commander in chief on January 6th, 2021. Okay. They wanted wanted Um, everyone to think she was, right? So before, because I know the guys are chomping at the bit to talk about some of the disinformation that we focus on here that has impacted you and your family. And obviously you um, still suffer the trauma from what occurred uh, by these radicalized individuals. But before we go there, I just want to say we here are profoundly grateful uh, that you continue to remind Americans through your book and your interviews about what occurred because our friend Ruth Ben-Ghiat, who is the foremost historian on Italian fascism, says that memory repression is uh, is a, an important kind of first phase of authoritarian capture. Mm-hmm. She said that people will be encouraged to memory hold a coup. The fact that you are here today, the fact that you've written a book in multiple languages to ensure people know the truth of that day is not only very, very important, but very, very brave. And we are grateful. In your book, you talk about what happened that day. You, somebody who served your country, you who served as a police officer are being called a traitor, that you uh, have been called these terrible names threatening your life. And you described the violence of being punched and kicked and shoved and sprayed and all of that. And clearly, that's not something that you just uh, wake up the next day and say, okay, I can go about, you know, about about my day. What kind of impact has this had on you that day, long term, uh, on you and your family? I mean, it's, it's very sad, you know, that a lot of uh, my own fellow citizens, they don't believe certain things that happen. They watch it on TV. They you know, while they were watching, guess what? I was fighting for my life. I was protecting the elected officials uh, inside the Capitol. I was protecting the people who work there and my colleagues. And I, as a subsequent uh, subsequence of that, uh, I sustained multiple injuries on my body. Uh, the most severe, my left shoulder, uh, was uh, sustained a, uh, an injury severe enough to have a surgery. My bicep is still detached. It still has recurring issues uh, occasionally. Uh, my right foot uh, have eight metal uh, screws in it in a plate. Uh, I still limp around once in a while, uh, depending on how my day is and how long. Um, those are the physical injuries I have with bleeding. Uh, both my hands are holding on the shield and pushing the mob out of the tunnel. And then you have certain people that says, well, on this part of the video, three or four hours later, uh, he doesn't seem to be injured. Guess what? I was full of adrenaline. I was trying to uh, save somebody's life. And then if I had, had not done that, then I would have said, well, look, he is tending his wounds rather than helping that lady that is me more is, is more uh, wounded than him. So it can't win with these people. It can't win... Uh, you know, they keep moving the goalposts. They keep making excuses. First, they took, you know, and I'm talking about uh, Miss Boylan, uh, you know, one of the writers that, that died. We tried to help her. And at first, uh, this Fox News personality uh, said that I killed her. Then there was somebody else killed her. Then it was Harry Dunn and myself. We tried to ha- hide the body. Then it was, oh, look, nothing happened. Oh, no, you know, he, he's... He's not severe enough. Uh, he's not even uh, limping. He's not bleeding. Well, I had the videos and the pictures of those moments uh, of me with both my hands bleeding. 
and that's going to be show be shown in court uh, in the coming month. Um, just to disprove that, because she reached out to uh, the lawyer of the person who injured me. So it, it's kind of like, well, look, he in that picture, that one ten seconds of the video. I, yes, I'm, 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 I seem normal, but I was not. I was in pain. I was fearful. I was trying to help somebody's life. Uh, but they don't get that. They never served this country. They never uh, had to take take a decision to other than for for themselves in terms of looking out for themselves. Uh, they're selfish. They will never be selfless like I had done. 23 years out of my 44 had been as a public servant, both overseas and here in the United States, uh, 17 years as, as a Capitol Police officer. In terms of um, the, the videos and footages, uh, you know, recently those were released by uh, the, the new Speaker of the House and, and just like the the previous one, uh, they selectively choose, cherry pick some of the footages. What they continue to show is themselves running from the mob, cowering into the safe house with the time that I, myself and my colleagues give them to, to get to their safe house, to their safe area, uh, because they were scared to death. And we put our bodies uh, on the line, uh, you know, and those, those, those things, uh, like I said, uh, you know, the physical injuries, uh, some of them they have healed, some of them have not. Uh, the mental trauma, the PTSD is still there. Uh, you know, how can I go back to work in an environment where I don't know whether I need to worry more about the people behind me or the people in front of me? You know, and as, a, as a police officer, I need to be confident that at least the people that I'm protecting, some, most of them don't have my back. And, Working in the Capitol, the last few months of me being there, that was hard. Sometimes I had to sit in front in my car, deciding whether to go back in or not into the Capitol because, again, I don't know if there was another uh, insurrection or not or another e event. Would they, uh, the the Republicans elected officials, would they help me close down the door or they will restrain me from pre to prevent me from? Uh, helping everybody else in there. And that was hard. Uh, as a police officer, I know I had to do my job part in, in partially. Uh, but, you know, having them looking over my shoulder, criticizing us, the police officer, uh, condoning what happened on January 6th, downplaying what happened on January 6th, uh, defending the action of the insurrectionists, uh, of what they did on January 6th, um, to the point of going to the Department of Justice uh, on the day of our testimony in front of Congress to demand that the same people who assaulted me and my colleagues should be released because these people are patriots. You know, uh, well, those patriots wanted to kill them. And guess what? We got in their way and stopped them. Uh, I think two weeks ago, the former president called them those people, peaceful hostages. Uh, well, if they were hostages, then what would that make me in that story? Would that make me the hostage taker, the sicarios? Uh, you know, you can't. And then they turn around and say, well, we support the police. We back the blue, law and order, law yeah. and order, rule of law. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, you know, and, and lastly, you had the, the moral injury. Um, you know, the moral injuries, I, we did our job. We, we, can, we defended the Capitol. We kept our oath. And yet each one of those, most of the Republicans, elected officials, uh, they continue to downplay what happened. They continue to spouse the same lies of uh, former president, peaceful, uh, political discourse, hostages, uh, patriots. Well, and, and the few that had come forward is because they are retiring and they had not, um, they're not seeking uh, office anymore. Um, just, uh, I think it was last two, two weeks ago, uh, again, uh, uh, Meyer from uh, one of the Congress uh, uh, members that voted uh, in favor to convict him from, for the second impeachment. He said that he would rather have Trump back in office rather than vote for Biden. After 91 counts 
uh, being convicted, you know, and this is the same guy who sent the mob to kill him and his colleagues, uh, the vice, his own vice president, um, you know, the next three, two people in the line of two sessions to the presidency, Nancy Pelosi and uh, Kevin McCarthy and the vice president. So uh, what's an attack on his own government to stay in power? And that's scary enough. If, and if that's not a national security, I don't get what is. Right. What, what, apparently what, Biden yeah, in his old age. What, what you just described is a battle, war. You just described war, but you also described the information war. And I'm so sorry that it is something that you have to deal with on top of your injuries because it's something that we deal with here on this show. The moment that we formed, we were under attack from um, all sides because truth is very dangerous in a time of grave deception where they rely on people to not know reality. And I'm going to quote you from January 6th, and then I'm going to uh, relinquish the, the chair to the guys. But here is what you said. There's a continued shocking attempt to ignore or try to destroy the truth of what truly happened that day and to whitewash the facts into something other than what they unmistakably reveal, an attack on our democracy by violent domestic extremists and a stain on our history and our moral standing here at home and abroad. I did not recognize my fellow citizens who stormed the Capitol on January 6th or the United States that they claim to represent. And that was after you referred to it as a medieval battle. I thank you for those words. Those words are historic. And it is still something that we're grappling with today. As Jim predicted, the second insurrection, which was occurring in the halls of Congress, would be worse than the first. And I fear that Americans have been blinded by the unreality created by people with, with the words that you just described, continually uh, masking the truth of what happened. Yeah, I mean, it's, people need to understand that Whatever happened with the uh, on January six, whether done by the former God, remove Trump's name out of the equation, would they be okay with Biden doing the same thing? And the answer is hell no. They would not be okay with it. They would not be okay with Kamala Harris uh, declaring that the president of the United States, his opponent, lost, and uh, and, and that they won. They would not stand by that and they will take up arm if they did that. Uh, so for the majority of the people to convince themselves to continue to, uh, you know, follow their own instinct in terms of uh, their own free will to seek the information they need and the evidence they there in front of them. Because again, they watch everything happen on TV. I lived it. I survived it. And I continue to tell my story in, through the courts and on in the media and the platform that I have now. But had it not been because of January 6th, nobody would know what I had done for this country, both overseas and you know, at the capital the last 17 years. I, I didn't seek out this. It was pretty much kind of like forced to become this person who I am now to tell people what happened to me, to let them know that this was not okay, that... I could have died, it could have been worse, not only for myself, but for the American people, for our democracy, for our institutions. Uh, and yet, they continue to uh, embrace this guy who had done nothing to help their lives because they continue to see him as a champion. A champion for who? For himself? What had, how had his, him being in office the last uh, four years he was helped them be better? to make any progress in their lives. When you have the same guy who claimed to be a billionaire and a millionaire and is asking them to send him money to, uh, for his campaign, but mostly for uh, his legal bills, you know, and they do it, that's insane because they probably need that money more than he does. He's a millionaire, a billionaire. And he's telling them, you know, hey, send me money. I'm fighting for you. No, you're fighting for your life. You're fighting for you to stay out of trouble, out of jail. 
And meanwhile, John Doe is living in the trailer, going down the trailer that's falling apart. And they send him money for no reason. Other than, be, other than to say, well, he speak it like it is. He speak American. Okay, mac and cheese. What, what else do you want? <laughs> you know, you know, oh, I, I man. Get, I, I don't get it. You know, those people have gone to jail. Like, if you look at the court system, uh, most of the people who have been processed through the court system for the their role at, on January 6th, a lot of them continue to spouse the same sentiment, and even though they go on, on uh, in front of the judge and claim and ask for leniency, the minute that the judge set them free, they are outside the court, telling, them, "Well, they, he believed me, blah blah blah," and making fun of the judge and and the the process that you they went through. And I, I, I it's, in, it's insane that these people decided to throw away their, their rationale and their logic and say, you know, one plus two is three. And, and then say, I'm, I'm, and not understand that it's not one plus two, it's not 10, like this guy is telling them that it is. Yes. Uh, so so it, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to have high fine Jim jump in, but I just want to tell you, I appreciate you using the word insane because it is it's it's not normal. It's crazy. Um, it shouldn't be like this. But again, it's tied into information warfare. Hi, fi So before we started recording, I said, you, sir, are a hero. and You denied it. And that right there, I think, makes you a hero that you have the humility and the courage to stand up for your country. Um, you were an immigrant. I, I would argue, hell, man, my family's been here since the 1800s, but I'm an immigrant. Uh, my family hasn't been here 10,000 years. We are a nation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. So anyone who uses that against you, uh, you tell them from me they're full of shit. All right? <laughs> and the I'm second trying, thing... I do that most of the time anyway. <laughs> well, I'm, just, I'm just throwing my voice behind you. But... Um, <laughs> There, there was a quote that I think applies uh, from George Orwell. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. What would you say to these people who are, even to this day, betraying your sacrifice, betraying Officer Fanon's sacrifice, Officer Harry Dunn's sacrifice, <coughs> Uh, what would you say to these people who are supposed to be leaders of this country, who are supposed to stand up for righteousness, for decency, and they have wormed their ways into the halls of our governments, these slime balls, and they continue to lie about you and attack you? What would you say to them? Um, not much. I mean, they know who I am. They know what I've done for this country. Uh, my records speak for themselves. I mean, I'm not. If you look behind me, there's a bunch of medals and, and awards. Um, I didn't. I don't think I had to show those to the public, but I had earned them throughout my uh, career as a public servant. Um, on January 6, I didn't do anything more than what was required of me, my duty. And I, I see that you said you mentioned to me earlier that I'm a hero. I don't consider myself as a hero. I just did my job. I kept my oath. Um, and, you know, I still have to take out the trash when my wife tells me. I still got to um, uh, pay, pay my bills and, and, and be a father. Um, I had, I, again, nothing that I've done uh, is outside what I thought it was my oath, my duty to, to do. Uh, now, in terms of the elected officials themselves, uh, besides Liz Cheney and Adam Kinsinger from the Republican side, there has been the only two that actually took their time to listen to me, to know my story, what I had done for this country. Um, yes, we are all immigrants uh, in this country. If you don't consider yourself an immigrant, you full of shit, like you said, uh, you know, because it, unless you were one of the Native Americans that were here uh, 300 years ago, then you are not a, 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 a American citizen by, you know, um, in, in, in terms of the 
elected officials themselves. Um, I don't know. Would they be okay with Kamala Harris and Joe Biden doing the same thing? Yeah. No, I, I don't. And mm-hmm. That has been said a lot. Uh, we did what we did to defend them, regardless of their political views and their ideology and party, uh, because it was uh, in our oath to protect and defend the capital of the United States and the Constitution. Now, a lot of those Republicans, elected officials, they had chosen to uh, defend Donald Trump rather than the country. And by the time they realized, by the time that they realized that they are, uh, had chosen wrong, and it's going to be too late. Because uh, the former president, he uses them uh, for his own uh, purpose, for his own gain. And the, by the time that they realize, like uh, uh, Cohen, uh, his lawyer, uh, Cohen, uh, find out he was already in trouble. Uh, by the time that Jeff Session find out he was in trouble, by the time Bill Barr find out he was already in trouble. So all these... Uh, all these guardrails and advisors that uh, he had in in place uh, on the first inauguration, uh, I mean, on, during his first administration, um, and keep were keeping him in check. They were no longer there. The same people, John Kelly, Mike Madden, uh, and the other generals. And as you know, he called them uh, the dumbest people he ever known. And these are generals from the military who have served this country for 30, 20, 40 years, uh, including uh, um, General Milley, who recently uh, uh, retired. Uh, all these people have served this country uh, honorably and defended this country honorably, but yet he calls them dumb as a rock and stock as a loser. Uh, for a guy who never uh, sacrificed anything other than himself, and all, I'm sorry, other than the country for his own gain, um, he has no nothing to show for. When he had the chance to, and the opportunity to serve his country, he got far deferment and, and, and avoid being drafted. You know, what else do you expect from somebody who only look out for himself rather than for the country and, and, and making people's lives better? You make an excellent point. I mean, Donald Trump is a selfish, vain, venal man. He is unfaithful to his wife. He is a liar. He is a fraud. He's been adjudicated a sexual predator. How could any veteran in this country still support that man? I just, um, actually, I do know how. And a lot of it has to do, you say that what you witnessed on January 6th was insane. Um, I would offer the idea that this country has been under attack from information warfare uh, for at least eight years, if not much, much longer. Uh, And people have been programmed to love Donald Trump to the point where they're willing to go to prison for him and engage in violence. And that, to me, sounds like a terrorist leader. I mean, it, it's as I discussed in my book, American Shield. You know, there's the, the certain things that always made me wonder: how can, how did Al Qaeda and uh, ISIS convince all these people to follow them? And, and it's wow. an ideology. Um, you know, you can't convince people that you know there's something else on the other side that people think differently. I just I find it really very hard. Uh, to know uh, that a lot of veterans themselves, uh, you know, are so sus- so subjected and susceptible to some of these things uh, that the former president says. Uh, I think two weeks ago I was in court, and one of those uh, people that were was being sentenced was Federico Klein, who happened to work for uh, the st- State Department under the Trump administration, and he's a former Marine. Um, who served, I think, I believe, in Afghanistan. And there's another one uh, uh, that I think was Capuciano. He also was a member of the Army. And both of them were members of the military. And I have my prepared remark for the second person because at first I didn't know that they had military background. 
So I was ready to give my prepared remarks to, to the court, uh, to the judge. And once I find out that there were members of, of the military, I, I, I told you, the judge, you know what? I have my prepared remarks, but I'm not going to read the remarks. You can read it yourself. But let me tell you how I'm feeling right now. The fact that these people, former military members, people who swore the same oath that I did, took arm to assault police officers, took arm to beat up and besiege the Capitol. That bothers me because one of the lawyers was claiming that because their time in deployment overseas and that they have PTSD, that they were more susceptible, that they decided to, that that's a cause why they uh, joined the mob. And, and be the police officer in, in, in the crowd. And I'm like, wait a minute, Your Honor, he just described my whole deal with uh, the VA, with my PTSD treatment and, and my conditions. I also serve overseas. I have PTSD, but that did not compel me to take all up arms to beat up police officer. That did not compel me to remove myself from the tunnel where I almost died not once, not twice, but multiple times. You know, that did not stop me from keeping my oath to defend the United States in, uh, in the Capitol, in my colleagues. So the fact, the mere fact that they're using that as an excuse is a way for them to ask for leniency and they full of shit. And I told them as such, one of them got, uh, I believe, five years plus, and the other one got seven years plus. Uh, I, I, I find it, disingenuous that a lot of them they have used that as an excuse uh but they're only doing that to seek leniency and as what you know i was attacked by more than 50 people uh, i continue to go through the court system i'll do my best to hold these people accountable especially those who attacked me on that day i will tell you my heart is warmed every time i see group shots of you and Harry and Daniel Hodges and Fanone. I'm so glad that you have a support group with each other. And I'm so grateful that you all have taken the time to write your truth, document your truth in these very important books, American Shield being yours. I do want to just quote you one more time um, because I want this to be what Americans uh, reflect on. Um, you, we talked a little bit earlier about the unpatriotism of attacking police officers for a party that always tries to claim backing the blue. That was not what was occurring that day. Uh, you said that the, you know, attacking police officers with the same flag they uh, came to represent. But here's what you said that I want people to really hear. It was an attempted coup and we were fighting for our lives. And to me, it still seems like the fight is ongoing as you fight for your truth, your family, your health, and truly, uh, you're fighting the good fight for America and democracy through telling uh, your story in your book. And is there anything that you can leave our viewers with from your book that's a particularly important or poignant uh, moment for you? I mean... Ultimately, what I pe want people to, to know is that we did our job. We kept our oath and nothing more. We, I, at least in my part, I didn't wake up that day and say, you know what? Today I'm going to get my ass kicked for many hours. And then two years later or three years later, I'm going to publish a book and get all these awards, accolades, and things like that. That did never occur to me, uh, like I mentioned to you earlier. And, and I mentioned in the book as well, had it not been because January 6th, mm -hmm. nobody would know what I had done for this country. Nobody would know what I did at the Capitol January 6th and before and after and during the uh, the aftermath. Uh, uh, my life would have been a lot simpler. Uh, my health would, I would still have my, my health. I would have been promoted to lieutenant, something that I never did uh, accomplish because of my injuries. Um, my financial stability would not be threatened. I would not be ridiculed by the same people who attacked me. You know, I want people to know that uh, my sacrifice and the sacrifice of the officers uh, had been uh, desecrated by the lies uh, of uh, Trump, Trump supporter and everybody else 
uh, that support his candidacy to become the president, especially Mitch McConnell, because of, he had the opportunity to uh, send this person to the dust of history, and he did it after the uh, second impeachment. Um, I remember when uh, doing the impeachment right after he he found him not guilty, he said, "Well, I do think that he's responsible." And uh, but we shouldn't hold him accountable because he's leaving office. Let the court system uh, and some, a civilian to take care of that. Then that happens, and when the court system is doing that, then he well, we can't prosecute a former president. And now he's becoming the candidate to become go back to the White House. And if God forbid he wins the White House, then Mitch McConnell is going to contour himself again and say, well, he can convict a former president who had left office, be indicted, and then get back in office. So he's going to be circling yeah. and making all kinds of excuses, um, but he had the opportunity to put him away. Same thing with Kevin McCarthy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when his life was on the line, they were scared. All of them were scared. I was scared. But guess what? I did my job. I did what I was supposed to regardless what I, how I felt and how threatened I was, uh, how injured I was, how exhausted I was, I did my job and I stayed and I remained on my post on January 6th and a couple of days later um, to defend the Capitol. And that was not out of uh, out of sense of uh, not wanting to be there. That was me being wanting to protect our country, the country that gave me uh, a leg up, a country that gave me an opportunity to become who I am, who I was, and build my character. I, I, an opportunity for me to defend my colleagues in all the democracy. And I did something that they would never understand, something that they would never do themselves, because if Kamala Harris and Joe Biden send the mob, or the Hillary Clinton mob, uh, you know, send the mob, just like as devastated as they were on 2016, Will they be okay with that? I doubt it. I doubt that they will condone that. I doubt that they will remain silent. And I, I know that they will call for riots and all these things and, and even take up arms to go to the Capitol and move these people. Uh, the irony is the, of that is that they ridicule us for doing our job for uh, and, and defending those people, including the same people who call us traitors or downplay what happened and co by calling them political prisoner, political discourse and all that. It, you know, had it been another group like Black Lives Matter, uh, like I mentioned in my book, summer 2020, that was, they were at the Capitol and they want us to do things to them. Uh, if you look at the reports, you, know, oh, you, sh you should start shooting them, you should, you should pepper spray them, you should, um, beat him up, rough him up, put him in jail, lock him up. But they don't want the same law or procedure to be done right. to yeah. their supporters, which is yeah. uh, kind of like let's, let's uh, support uh, the police if they go after the people that we think they are doing wrong to us. And that's how they feel, like it's a transaction. I know, I remember I was inside the tunnel and there were people saying, well, when in 2020, when the whole world hated you, we had your back. Therefore, let us in. Let us in. Are you serious? Are you, is that how, uh, that's not how our, our police police worked. And, and it was their, your support for us doing Black Lives Matter did not, I didn't request that. That's you decided to, to do that. And the mere fact that they were, seeing that as a, a transactional thing. Let us burn the capital because Black Lives Matter burned certain cities and looted certain places. Well, guess what? Black Lives Matter could have taken uh, Kenosha, uh, Portland, uh, Minnesota, and the way of our system of governance would not have been threatened. On January 6th, our govern, uh, system of governance was being threatened to the point of uh, then almost the entire cabinet of members of uh, elected officials were the target. And the only person who was 
admiring all this and re revolutioning uh, everything that happened, it was doing it from afar, 16 blocks away in broad daylight. Uh, and and yeah. to the point of, look, hey, look, this is what they're doing for me. This they they fighting for me and beating police officers with the American flag and, and, and chanting, fight for Trump, fight for Trump. We're here for Trump. And it didn't matter what, how we said it. it, didn't matter whether we had the capital on lockdown, uh, how many layers of security they breach, they were still not listening to the police officers. And the only person who had the influence to do that, to calm them down, was Donald Trump. And by the time he actually did that, it was already too late because they already had breached the Capitol. They had assaulted and injured many, many officers. Officially, there's only uh, 140, 150 officers uh, injured. But there were a lot of officers who remained silent and kept themselves because they felt, if I report my injuries, then that means I'm not going to be able to come back to work and continue to defend the Capitol. Mm -hmm. and, my and that's if that's not scary enough for you to think that that was happening, when the whole country uh, assist, assist, assistance was being threatened, I, I don't know what, what to tell you. And, and you asked me early, how do I convince uh, politicians to see it the way we do? Well, they will never understand. They will never see because they got to go home safe. They got to go home without none of them being injured. When they say nothing happened at the Capitol and downplay, well, nothing happened to who? They got to go home. They got to go home to their family. They got to go to a safe area within the Capitol or evacuate the Capitol. Meanwhile, we were fighting for our lives. We put our bodies in front of the mob. We were injured. We, were, we bled. We got tear gas. We got uh, bunions by, by all kinds of things that were throwing and spray at us. Uh, and that's the only reason why they are now saying that nothing happened. But I would like Mr. Johnson, Speaker Johnson, to show the picture of him running away from the Capitol, him and his colleagues, him and McCarthy, him and Marjorie Taylor Greene and everybody else who continue to say, well, it was peaceful. If it was so peaceful, why don't you show the picture of you guys running uh, for your lives uh, with the time that we allowed them to, to do so. But I, and the last thing, uh, the book is in Spanish as well, The American Shield, uh, the Sergeant you know, Defended Democracy, and uh, in Spanish, uh, Escudo Americano, El Sargento que Defendió America. Uh, please uh, support, uh, and if you can, also, please write a review uh, on Good Reading, uh, Amazon, or Barnes & Noble, uh, because uh, you got the MAGA people, uh, they're trying to sink it, you know, it's, uh, leaving bad reviews, saying it's fake. They not, hadn't even read it, and they're already saying it's fake. They had not even know any of the sacrifices that I had done for this country, and yet they are saying uh, it is fake. Uh, well, if it's fake, then I guess... Uh, uh, Trump is the Messiah, and he's not. So you're among friends here. We are here to help. Let me tell you, we are here to help. We have a global audience that is very literate. They will read your book. They will do as instructed, and uh, many of them very generous. So we hope to be a part of the great success of this book. The last thing I'd like to say is that after you testified, in front of the January 6th committee, I said in front of Jim and Hi-Fi, uh, that man is an American hero. And Jim said, they never wanted to be heroes. And that's true. It, it came to you and you guys were doing your job. And I just want to say on behalf of the team, we are very, very grateful that you did your job that day because I fully believe that our democracy is still standing because of people like you. So <laughs> thank you. I I never thought I would speak, um, be a good voice about certain things. Um, I remember in, co in college and high school, I was asked to be in front of people uh, and speak, and I never, I said, no, nah, I'm good. Um, but I think 
as I mentioned in my book, American Shiwe, it's the moment in our history, this moment in history required me not to be silenced. Um, I continue to be the voice, uh, not only for myself, but advocating for some of my colleagues where I see it uh, being necessary. Um, one thing that I want people to know is the sacrifice, not just on January 6th that I had done. Uh, if you look at, I had shielded this country, I had shielded um, both from overseas threats and here in the United States. I shielded my family, I shielded my relatives, I shielded my family and continue to shield the truth of what happened. If they want to investigate me, let them. Uh, all they're gonna do is confirm that they're wrong. Um, you know, I continue to be that voice. And, and if you have the chance to read my book, please do. Uh, leave a review. I go. It will go a long way, and it will make a excellent, excellent gift for the holiday as well. So, yes. I'll buy it, one for my right dad there. right now. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so very much. The book is American Shield English and Spanish translations. Buy them for the holidays. Great stocking stuffers for those who care about democracy and even those who may be on the fence about what happened. If, Why don't you give you them know, a beautiful, if, beautiful book of truth? If anything, you could buy it for your Republican friend and so they could burn them or, uh, or ban them. <laughs> you know, who, who knows what they're going to who, who know what they're going to do now? You know, they, they block and bind the truth and uh, contour the truth or to make it fit to, to, you know, let them buy it or give it to them and see what, maybe they'll read it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is you never know what word or what moment might actually get people back to themselves. Uh, people don't brainwash themselves, as Jim always says. And you never know the moment. Maybe there will be something there. Maybe something you write will actually uh, trigger that cascade where they come back to themselves. Maybe finding out police officers were genuinely attacked with an American flag may be what it takes for somebody to reject this MAGA extremism. We thank you so much. We are so grateful you spent this time with us.